Well, a major foreign policy action of his presidency was an attempt to restore a monarchy in place of a constitutional democracy. And some, even today, love him for it. ask a presidential candidate who their favorite president was, and you can expect some of the same answers. Truman, Kennedy, Franklin Roosevelt, Ronald Reagan. But we shouldn't expect convention from an unconventional candidate. And thus, it shouldn't shock that when Ron Paul was asked this question by Jay Leno, Paul said, Grover Cleveland. The 22nd president does not get a lot of play. He's known, if anything, for his non-consecutive terms. But those of us, you and I, who like a little history with our politics, were delighted hearing the mention. Paul, a candidate for the Republican Party with a libertarian streak, has attracted a big following among voters of both parties. And thus, Cleveland's gotten a little more attention as of late as Paul fans try to find out who their hero's hero is. We'll look a bit at this Paul-Cleveland comparison, whether libertarians, Republicans, or even his compatriot Democrats would have liked Cleveland very much. But one thing that's clear, he's a very different kind of president than what we'd expect today, with a value system that might seem to be from the moon. And speaking of faraway places, one place that this is evident is in the island chain that is now our 50th state. But in 1887, without jet planes, it was a faraway land. As Cleveland was rounding out his first term in office, it was an independent kingdom. Hawaii was not isolated, however. Both Britain and the United States had trade and diplomatic relations with Hawaii. In fact, President Cleveland had just scored an agreement for a lease of a naval station in an area called Pearl Harbor. Under President Arthur, the first appropriations were made for steel hull warships and for the American Navy. But Cleveland saw the project to fruition, removed the corruption in the Navy Department, and added additional ships to the order. A nation with Atlantic and Pacific interests, with future interest in a canal, most likely in Nicaragua, people thought at the time, needed a station in the Pacific for refueling, for defense. The nation had some 2,000 Americans living there who started as missionaries but also got involved in commercial transactions, especially the pineapple and sugar businesses. Among these, the missionary's son turned sugar baron, Lauren Andrews Thurston. He had, along with the Honolulu Rifle Company militia, forced the Hawaiian king to sign at gunpoint a constitution which disenfranchised most of the 40,000 native Hawaiians on the island. The property and income requirements for voting were so high that most natives wouldn't make it. By 1893, the tail end of Benjamin Harrison's presidency, Thurston and the white settlers got more anxious. A recent tariff change made it so that there was no advantage for Hawaiian sugar. Since 1875, during the Grant administration, it had not been considered a foreign producer of sugar. It was given favorable treatment status. But 1890s tariff legislation eliminated that advantage and gave an advantage to U.S. domestic producers. Thus, it was time for Hawaii to become not a nation, but a state. However, there was a problem. There was a new queen on the throne, Liliu Kalana and she wished to dissolve the so-called bayonet constitution and restore power to native Hawaiians. January 16, 1893, the settlers struck back. They stormed the palace, took the queen prisoner, and formed a committee of safety, as revolutionaries always seem to do. But before any opposition from supporters of the queen might have taken place, the American minister to Hawaii, John Stevens, working for the Harrison administration at this time, brings the American warship USS Boston, to harbor and lands Marines to intimidate the opposition. Stevens immediately recognizes the committee as a provisional government of Hawaii. He works for the Republicans, the Harrison administration. James Blaine is Secretary of State. James Blaine is Secretary of State, pro-expansionist, pro-annexation. He declares the Republic of Hawaii an American protectorate and puts an American flag on the palace. Well, okay then, but there is a little issue here. It's 1893, so you've got to work quick because Republicans have lost the presidential election. Democrats won. They will not control the presidency in a few months. It's January 17th. Now, fortunately, in the old days, 
the president doesn't take office on the 20th, you have till March before the new guy is sworn in. So Thurston and the Republican administration rush a steamer over to San Francisco and there take a train to Washington, D.C. By February 13th, you've got a treaty in Benjamin Harrison's hands. He immediately sends it over to the Senate, urges its passage, urges annexation, and it goes to the Senate. Well, one thing you can always count on is that body to be a little bit slower than other areas of the federal government. And so the Hawaii annexation is debated and debated, and it's still debated when Cleveland is sworn in for his second term on March 4th, 1893. He pulls the tree from the Senate five days after taking office. He says, I'd like to investigate this a little more. He sends his friend James Blount, former congressman of Georgia, to investigate. Blount is an anti-imperialist, finds evidence that the Marines assisted the revolution, that they were still assisting policing the nation, that without these Marines, the Hawaiian people might have resisted the Revolutionary Committee. Stevens was compliant. The Hawaiian native people were against the revolution, and no popular vote was taken or scheduled to be held to support this revolutionary group. Cleveland accepts his friend Blount's report and says that a great error was made. But because there was a government in place, and it would take a fight to get them out, Cleveland's options as a president were limited. So he sends a new minister over to Hawaii, men named Willis, with two warships. And in a show of force, Willis parades them around the harbor before he gets off. Then he goes to the provincial government, led by President Sanford Dole, and he also visits the queen, Lili Kukulani, and he tries to get both of them to back down. The president refuses. Dole says, I don't believe Cleveland has any ability to influence the Hawaiian government. We're a separate country. The queen also refuses. If she's restored to power, she will punish her enemies and see that they hang. But by Christmas 1893, the queen backs down. Okay, if she's restored to power, she won't punish her enemies. She'll restore the bayonet constitution of 1887, and she'll merely call for exile for the top leaders of the revolution. Cleveland then issues a statement. Cleveland then issues a statement very critical of what his own country has done in Hawaii. If national honesty is to be disregarded and a desire for territorial extension or dissatisfaction with a form of government other than our own, a reference to the monarchy, might regulate our conduct, then I suppose I misunderstand the character of our government. Well, Cleveland isn't exactly a soundbite guy. He's an old Buffalo lawyer, and he writes that way, but everyone got the meaning. If I were to somewhat fictitiously place the statement of Cleveland in more modern times, his statement is straight out of George McGovern, straight out of even Michael Moore, anti-imperialist, don't interfere in these other nations. It was a change from the expansionist foreign policy of his predecessor, from the desires of many. The annexation of Hawaii, Cleveland wrote, was a departure from unbroken tradition in providing for the addition to our territory of islands that were more than 2,000 miles away from our nearest coast. There was bitter opposition to Cleveland's statement of anti-imperialism. Opposition was loud. Republican organs like the New York Commercial Advertiser said, in ordering old glory pulled down in Honolulu, President Cleveland has turned back the hands on the dial of civilization. The Hawaiian Islands shall now be tossed into the arena of international strife. Japanese, English, heaven knows who will be waiting to take them. The Atlanta Constitution, more of a democratic organ, also hit hard even though Cleveland was a democratic president. The Democratic Party, the Constitution wrote, is not in the habit of restoring monarchies. Well, Cleveland was in a bit of a pickle here, and in the end, he could not order an invasion. His experts told him the only way to remove the provisional government now would be by force. American people in Congress wouldn't support that. So he said he was forced to refer the matter to Congress. And, as president, he promised to cooperate in any way with a legislative solution to the Hawaiian problem. This is very different from how today's presidents would do things in foreign policy. Congress investigated the Hawaiian matter. Both the Queen and the leaders of the provisional government came to Washington, D.C. to argue its case. Congress sent its own investigator, who was a little less critical than the president's men Blount. The Congress took no significant action, and Cleveland was forced to accept the new government. 
Yet in this, and later in a request to annex Cuba in his last months, when Cleveland insisted on our neutrality and peace in the matter, he was counter to the direction the United States was going, the direction of imperialism, of colonization, a toned-down foreign policy that is alien to the later half of the 20th century. But wouldn't have been so much at the time, at least to some, a significant minority at least, certainly wouldn't have been foreign to the United States of the 20s or the 30s, and is increasingly, in the wake of two recent wars, something politicians of both parties might be hearkening back to. We see in Hawaii and Cuba, where Cleveland could match Ron Paul of today, calling for toned-down foreign policy. The plot thickens. I am sick at heart and perplexed in brain most waking hours. Is it fun to be president? Well, it might be it sometimes, but indeed, it's not easy being president now, and it never was. If we think the stress of the presidency is limited to the days of the atomic suitcase, the red phone, the situation room, DEFCON 4, and the like, even a president in Cleveland's time had it rough. Thousands of appointments were made directly by the president. There were 126,000 federal employees. And even though this was after the time of civil service reform, only 15,000 of those employees were affected by the nominal legislation. This office seeking is a disease, Cleveland wrote a friend. The clock has struck 10 and the doors must be opened to the throng. When will it stop? The honest mayor of Buffalo, the honest governor of New York, with great reputation, who attracted bipartisan support, had been elected to come to Washington to clean up the mess. And despite all the stress, Cleveland stood up pretty well. He was elected as a Democrat, with the help of mugwumps, dissident Republicans in New York, and counted among his friends people like R. R. Bowker, Carl Schurz. He was also elected with the help of the regular Democratic Party. And the party now, with the first representative of the party of Jefferson, the party of Andrew Jackson, who said, to the victor goes the spoils, the first representative in 20 years since the Civil War, they started lobbying for various offices that they could get, the spoils. There were Republicans in a lot of offices now. That was a lot of federal graft that could be swung to the other party. Yet, they got a very different reaction from this Democrat than what they expected when one group of party regulars approached him and asked about an office held by a Republican who still had time on his term, but could be replaced by a Democrat. The new president shocked them. I wasn't aware of a vacancy in that position, he simply said. Cleveland had insisted that he would follow the spirit and not necessarily the letter of civil service reform. Republicans in a position would serve out their term and not be replaced just because of their party, unless they were proven incompetent. He had a pretty high standard for that. In New York, in a carefully watched move, Cleveland kept the Republican postmaster, Henry Person, known for his honesty, under tremendous pressure from Tammany Hall, the machine in New York, to appoint a person from their organization. When a delegation from Minnesota came back, so empty-handed, they had a slate of federal offices that they wanted to fill, and they came back to Minnesota with just one from Cleveland. They were burned in effigy. A powerful Senator Butler of South Carolina, who was used to getting what he wanted within the Democratic Party, was quickly rebuffed by Cleveland, so much that he learned his lesson, and he went to the Treasury office to apply for jobs for his friends like everyone else. I have ascertained that this is the place to file my request, he told the shocked employees. The man from Buffalo had quickly earned the reputation. If you look him in the face and jaw, you will see he means what he says, one congressman said. Yet there were a lot of complaints. The party had worked hard to throw out the other party, Adelai Stevenson not the guy that ran for president in the 50s, this was his grandfather, said that but 10% of the postmasters were replaced. Most were still Republicans. If you are a reformer, you will face this conundrum. You want to enter office and not have the government opposed to you. You want your people in there. But yet, since you've run on the banner of reform, it's unseemly to make the government yours like that. Do you end up just keeping the status quo? For Cleveland, this was the dilemma. 
He could end up, four years in power, as critics said, just keeping the other party's people in. And some of them were just cronies. They were just put into office with the same type of status quo decisions, political hacks, patronage. Grover the Good becomes Grover the Go-Along to Get Along. Joseph Pulitzer's New York World reprinted a letter from Thomas Jefferson when he replaced the New Haven Custom Collector with a Republican. Federalists had the public service, Jefferson said. Few die and none resign, defending his action. One congressman complained to the administration, the men who raise the money, the men who vote, are very upset. Cleveland would respond with comments like, When I think about the obligations to the country, all other obligations I'm presented with fade. Now, we have to remember here, Cleveland was not in office because of the New York Tammany Hall or any of these political machines. He was in office because of the New York reformers, the mugwump and dissident Democrats. Samuel Tilden, the hero of many of the Democratic Party after he was, quote, robbed of the presidency in the 1876 election, had helped to put him in office. So Cleveland clearly came from the reform side of the Democratic Party, and so standing up to political bosses was good politics too. Yet, even Cleveland had to give in a little, and particularly in his second and third year, 85, 86, he appointed more of his party, nowhere near what they wanted. There were two other areas where Cleveland sought reform. Railroads and other interests were taking government land, and by corrupting local surveyors, they were getting it. Cleveland's attorney general investigated and found 200 cases of perjury and took some of these lands back and insisted on stopping the encroachment of federal land by railroads. He attempted to settle the question of settlers moving in to Indian lands by reforming Indian policy. The federal government would give each Indian citizenship and acres of land. Land would be given to individual citizens and not tribes. This was the Dawes Act. And it did not turn out well. Of course, uh, Indians were not consulted in the process of making the law. Later law would see millions of acres taken from Indians as they were declared incompetent by the federal government. In the midterm of 1886, like all presidents, his party lost seats in the House. Yet despite his weakened position, backbiting from political bosses and newspapers of his own party, Cleveland took on a large issue of his time, the tariff. Tariff, a tax on imports. This was the source of revenue for the federal government in the 1800s. He didn't have a federal income tax. So in advocating a low tariff, he was embracing the libertarian issue of his times. In effect, it was a tax cut. Generally, the East, with its manufacturing and labor factories, liked tariffs. They liked them high to protect industries from foreign competition. And the South and West liked to reduce tariffs so that the goods they needed that they had to pay for would cost less. Grover Cleveland pushed for a tariff bill in 1886, then again in 1887. He wasn't completely hands-off. He wasn't afraid to lobby congressmen to call them into the White House and to campaign for his legislation. And when those two attempts failed, he was warned in his last year of his first term, it's an election year and you should let up. But instead... In 1888, he issued another message advocating tax reform and ensuring that it would be an issue in his re-election. If a man stands for nothing, he should not run, Cleveland said. Well, we learn in history that Cleveland was the only president who was re-elected, but not in consecutive terms. Thus, he is Mr. 22 and Mr. 24 with the bearded Benjamin Harrison in between for a stint. But this is with no context. Why was he not re-elected the first time, and why was he allowed to come back? This tariff message is part of the reason. Groups like the Iron and Steel Association, the Protective Tariff League, turned against him. The 1,000 Defenders of American Industries, each of whom pledged $100 yearly to do just that, defend American industries and high tariffs. All of these groups conspired to get him out of office. Mark Hanna, who had become a kingmaker, financier, and talked about presidential candidate later, got his start in presidential politics here in this election, raising $100,000, a lot of money at the time, for the RNC in 1888. Cleveland had stirred up a hornet's nest and ensured a well-funded effort against him. 
Mild party support was another reason Cleveland lost. In Indiana, the great swing state of the 1880s, his people reported that all the Democrats that he didn't appoint from that Democratic political machine in Indiana were now angry, and the party effort there was lifeless. In New York, Tammany Hall was just so-so for President Cleveland's re-election. I mean, they didn't want a Republican per se, but they didn't love Cleveland either. The leaders of Tammany pledged the support to the president, but ward leaders didn't pull as they had in the past. Cleveland lost Indiana, and he lost New York in that 1888 election. He won the popular vote, but he lost the Electoral College, and that's one of the three elections where that occurred, 1876, 1888, and now 2000. Now, because this isn't soundbite history and we have a little time and things are complex, I'd like to do a little sidebar there and say that this is not the raw injustice that maybe it appears. You know, someone winning the popular vote and not winning in the Electoral College. Cleveland indeed won the popular vote in 1888, but as a Democrat, we have to remember he was winning in all these southern states where Black voters were really not free to vote in presidential elections, and few were free to vote Republican at all. Thus, his popular vote was certainly enhanced. Why did Cleveland come back? Absence makes the heart grow fonder. It's the only way to explain how Cleveland got a fairly easy nomination from his party for a second try. The other is the poor performance of Benjamin Harrison, particularly a hated McKinley tariff, with which raised tariff which raised prices on common household items. Tammany tried to extract... Before he was allowed to run again, Tammany Hall tried to extract a promise of offices. He was called to a meeting, but he said, No promises. Gentlemen, I will not go to the White House, pledge to you or anyone else. Given the high tariff that had passed, Cleveland's low-tariff message now had new zest. He won a fairly easy election. And he took office with the House and Senate of his party, the political bosses tamed to an extent, not as an outcast anymore, but now the leader of his Democratic Party. And right out of the starting gate, he supported a moderate lower tariff, the Wilson Bill, and he got it. Note something here. In that Wilson bill, not only was it a low tariff bill, but because low tariffs would drastically reduce the revenues to the government, no one wanted to cut the government in half, not even fiscally conservative Grover, he supported an income tax to even out federal revenues a little with the, all the, the revenues that would be lowered from the low tariff. He was told it would not be constitutional. Grover refused on both counts. He said it was constitutional and that he supported it. Eventually, the tax was ruled at that time unconstitutional by a very conservative Supreme Court. But, indeed, Cleveland got his low-tariff bill passed, progress being made, and then, wham, one of the worst depressions to hit the nation, 1894 and 1895. Another sidebar about that 1894 depression, I've done a podcast on it. We don't have all the fancy government stats of the 20th century the economic bureaus, though there are some backward estimates. And you have the oral stories, the writings of people back then, revealing that that 1894 was a depression as bad, perhaps, as the Great Depression, without the newsreel or the WPA photographs. Not only were people losing their jobs, homes, businesses, farms, but gold was leaving our banks and going to foreign banks. In 1894, $73 million worth of gold was shipped to Europe, mostly London. This was a problem. The New York sub-treasury, a less powerful New York Fed of its day, was saying it was going to run out of gold. I am dreadfully forlorn, Cleveland tells his friends. Cleveland's treasury secretary and he agreed to issue a bond to raise money for the gold, and so incurred government debt in order to produce more gold. That was quickly used up. Then, Cleveland meets with his Treasury Secretary and J.P. Morgan and August Belmont, wealthy financiers of their time, and debated a private sale of a bond. J.P. Morgan was persuasive here. He tells Cleveland, you can't go public. Everyone knows how desperate the U.S. government is, 
how bad the situation is at the New York sub-treasury that you're running out of money, the bonds will depreciate. Trust us. Cleveland chafed at the government engaging in a private sale of bonds. Morgan pointed out how the New York sub-treasury had at this time $9 million in gold. And Morgan said, I know of one check alone outstanding for $12 million. Well, there you have it. The government sells $62 million in bonds to these financiers and their partners in exchange for gold. The price is $100. Morgan and Belmont and their small group eventually sell them for $112 each. The profit that they make does not go unnoticed in the Western press and among the supporters of silver money, the people who would later be called Bryanites. One congressman condemns the dark lantern financing of the government, the conspiracy between the Cleveland administration and Wall Street. Cleveland assures he's only doing what he could to save the country from bankruptcy. Does all this sound a little familiar? Those actions would ensure that Cleveland would not again get the nomination of his party, and in the next election wasn't even invited to the Democratic Party convention. Oh, but if that one didn't delight the populace, wait till they got a load of how Cleveland dealt with the Pullman strike. This was one of the largest strikes in America. Disrupted commerce, halted the mails, led to violence, and put Chicago in a state of siege. During this time, a young orator and activist named Eugene Debs came to prominence. The Pullman Company, the cattle barons, the fine citizens of Chicago said their city had become a mob scene. That the strike had become a riot. They appealed to Illinois Governor Atgild, but he was elected with labor support and was actually an avowed socialist. He did nothing. And so, they appealed to President Cleveland. The president called in 5,000 nationalized militia to crush the strike, which he did. And then he saw that the leaders, including Debs, were indicted on federal charges, disrupting the mail service, among others. Eastern papers supported Cleveland, but he was attacked by labor supporters. Henry George said he'd rather see every railroad car ditched than to see a federal standing army. Made a hero out of Debs. He was attacked by state rights supporters, too. Governor Hogg of Texas was direct about this. The president should not try to do that in Texas. Hogg didn't like the violation of a governor's prerogative. Texas, he said, can handle the situation and enforce law itself. This brings up another point in this discussion about Grover Cleveland. Would a Democrat today like this Bourbon Democrat? Was he just a gold bug anachronism from the 19th century? Nothing to do with you if you're listening and you're a Democrat. Did he belong more to the people listening who are Republican? The quick answer is that the party of Pelosi and Obama and Howard Dean would not like that strike-breaking story, nor the fiscal conservatism he showed, vetoing increases in the public purse. Faced with a depression like 1894, there's no way a majority of modern Democrats would agree with his lack of federal action, refusal to instigate any kind of federal spending, the way that he turned his head on Coxley's army as it marched across America and tried to occupy Capitol Hill, seeking unemployment insurance and other things. Yet, Like so many things in history, the call isn't that easy. Today's Democrats might not respect him in those areas, but when it comes to his abhorrence of America seeking to be the world's policeman, to own and settle every piece of land, limiting America to basic national security and perhaps defending the Monroe Doctrine, which he did, they might like that. They might find his rejection of Cuban annexation appealing, his defense of the Hawaiian people appealing on tariffs. Not all Democrats might be thrilled with free trade, but they might like that in supporting low tariffs, Cleveland was taking a big swing at big corporations of his time, and he brought on their wrath. Everybody likes uncorrupt good government, right? And that's what Grover the Good stood for more than anything else. Like Cleveland, Ron Paul's not necessarily in sync with all of his party. Some wonder why he's a Republican at all. You'll see things on blog posts about when do we get rid of this guy, that kind of thing, the low spending, the tax cuts. Paul is right there with the Republican Party. He is perhaps more vocal than Republican leaders will be, but he might represent their deepest wants. Paul would clearly eliminate the HUD, Commerce, Interior, and Education Departments. He'd kill FEMA and let states handle emergencies on their own. 
He'd keep schools public, state-run schools, but he'd get rid of federal support. And he would have no issues with states running voucher programs or private schools. Some of these issues are supported by Republicans. There are some things they wouldn't like. He'd repeal the Patriot Act. He'd enhance civil liberties, scale the military back, limit the CIA to information gathering only, and end covert ops. As president, he'd be a real enemy to the Fed. And as for Social Security, you'd probably see an opt-in under a president poll for those 25 or younger, eventually phasing the program out. But everybody wants to protect the old people that are in the program. With the most vetoes of any president in his time, and with Franklin Roosevelt needing four terms to beat his veto record, Cleveland would certainly be Ron Paul's man on spending and fiscal policy. The federal taxes of his day were tariffs, and in that way, Cleveland supported tax cuts, just like Paul. Those are areas where I suspect Paul's Jay Leno statement comes out of. However, in a broader look, there are some areas where Paul 2012 does not meet up with Cleveland 1884. We talked about Cleveland's support for an income tax. We talked about the private sale of U.S. debt to Wall Street to save the New York sub-treasury. That might irk a Paul supporter today. His use of federal power to stop a strike-turned-mob, perhaps riot, is more subjective call. I mean, any president, even a President Paul, might react swiftly to stop an obvious disorder in a major American city. But doing it over the head of a state official, that might not line up well with today's libertarians. Still, as Paul lines up some delegates, as he comes in number two in several states, New Hampshire, Minnesota, Maine, Washington, earns a million votes, more than a million, perhaps brings more attention to strict libertarianism than the Cato Institute could ever dream of, he's found, I believe, a good model in President 22 and 24. All presidents face events that will pull them at times from a definite ideology, as Cleveland was pulled, as President Paul, if it ever happened, might be pulled. There are compromises made with Congress, political machines, with the popular press. Being at the central of federal power, it's not surprising that presidents have sought to expand and not condense it. Therefore, there are few models for a libertarian really to pull from. Thomas Jefferson? Well, that's one. And in his early years, he made cuts to the Federalist excesses in government, certainly. Yet, Jefferson left that government after eight years larger than the Federalists had made it. And his acquisition of Louisiana from France brought angry charges of abuse of executive power. Forced to settle the sale before Napoleon changed his mind, Jefferson had wanted to actually add an amendment to the Constitution to give him the power to make the Louisiana Purchase never got around to it. So he spent $15 million on purchasing an area the Federalist opponents called a wasteland populated by savages. So Jefferson is a model, but in some ways not. Harding, Coolidge, they could be models for libertarians today, but again, while not expanders of federal power, they took office in a time when the federal government was already amped up. The biggest increase in the federal government percentage-wise was under Woodrow Wilson not actually during the New Deal. So, yes, they brought it down a bit, but didn't significantly chip away at that large federal government of the 1920s. Reagan? Well, it's not likely for Paul that Reagan would be a libertarian model, as Paul himself criticized President Reagan during his stint in Congress and voted against his budget. So Grover makes a close model, and it's good to see Grover get a little press. He deserves to be known for something more than the guy who had two non-consecutive terms. 19th century presidencies are more exciting than get reported in the historical textbooks. Same type of politics that occurred today occurs then. Grover is also important if you're a Democrat to know about. I mean, got to know your party's history. He was the only Democrat to hold the White House in a 52-year period. Without his presidencies, the result of a cobbled coalition to get elected, who knows if Democrats would have competed on a presidential stage ever again. 52 years with only Cleveland's presidencies. James Buchanan could have been the last Democratic president. And if you take it back to the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, when there was no Jack Kennedy to talk about and when FDR was just a young guy getting started, Cleveland's name certainly would have been mentioned as a respected president. And yes, just like today, more than a few would have cussed him out as responsible for all the problems in the land, the economic ruin, 
Even if after listening to all this, you don't really come out liking the positions of this guy, Grover Cleveland, very much, here is something to consider. I believe Cleveland's important for restoring the president to its role as an executive who makes decisions, who says yes and no, rather than being what party hacks were attempting to have it be in the 19th century, the flag holder and yes man of the party. In that way, Grover made an important contribution to the executive branch, one that is still embedded in the office today. Thus, if a Ron Paul-type person seeks to take office with a radical change agenda, if, in the unlikelihood that he's elected, he would have to say no an awful lot to an awful lot of people, well, forget the minor policy distinctions. Grover is indeed his guy. I want to thank you for listening. The website is www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. We've got a new website. Very excited about that. A special thank you to Richard Bay. I was recently on uh, Richard Bay's Sirius XM Talk Left show, and it was a very good discussion about a lot of different issues. I do appreciate the kind words that he had to say about the My History Can Beat Up Your Politics program. I'm very grateful every time I do see a positive reference about the program. I'm even grateful when I see a negative reference sometimes about uh, my history can beat up your politics out there. All publicity is good publicity, right? Do what you can. Spread the word if you like the program. You know, there's got to be people like you who also like it who don't know about it yet. And that's the best way to help me and thank me for doing the program. I want to thank you for listening.